Good morning. Let us continue on in our study of Farmer Boy. This morning's chapter is entitled Christmas, and it is chapter 26. We are nearing the end of the year. Remember, we started out our book with um, the beginning of the year. And as we finish up the book of Farmer Boy, we are going through the entire year. So January all the way through December. All righty. Christmas is the name of this chapter. For a long time, it seemed that Christmas would never come. On Christmas, Uncle Andrew and Aunt Delilah, Uncle Wesley and Aunt Lindy and all of the cousins were coming to dinner. It would be the best dinner of the whole year. And a good boy might get something in his stocking. Bad boys found nothing but switches in their stockings on Christmas morning. Elmanzo tried to be good for so long that he could hardly stand the strain. But at last, it was the day before Christmas, and Alice and Royal and Eliza Jane were home again. The girls were cleaning the whole house, and Mother was baking. Royal helped Father with the threshing, but Elmanzo had to help in the house. He remembered the switch, and he tried to be willing and cheerful. He had to scour the steel knives and forks and polish the silver. He had to wear an apron around his neck. He took the scouring brick and scraped a pile of red dust off it, and then he went with a wet cloth and rubbed the dust up and down on the knives and the forks. The kitchen was full of delicious smells. Newly baked bread was cooling. Frosted cakes and cookies and mince pies and pumpkin pies filled the pantry shelves. Cranberries bubbled on the stove. Mother was making dressing for the goose. Outdoors, the sun was shining on the snow. The icicles twinkled all along the eaves. Far away, sleigh bells faintly jingled, and from the barns came the joyful thud-thud of the flails. But when all the steel knives and forks were done, Almanzo soberly polished, polished the silver. Then he had to run to the attic for sage, and he had to run down to the cellar for apples and upstairs again for onions. He filled the wood box. He hurried into the cold to fetch water from the pump. He thought maybe he was through. Then, anyway, for at least a minute. But no, he had to polish the dining room side of the stove. Do the parlor side yourself, Eliza Jane, mother said. Elmanzo might spill the blacking. Elmanzo's insides quake. He knew what would happen if mother knew about that black splotch hidden on the parlor wall. He didn't want to get a switch in his Christmas stocking, but he would far rather find a switch there than have father take him to the woodshed. That night, well, let's talk about that for just a minute. Finding a switch in your stocking at that time meant that you were a bad boy and you were going to get a spanking. But the same thing meant if father was going to take him to the woodshed, that was the same thing. He was still going to get a spanking, but he wasn't going to get a spanking with a switch. He was going to get a spanking with a piece of wood or something. Well, that doesn't sound like fun, right? Almanzo tried very hard to be a good boy. That night, everyone was tired and the house was so clean and neat that nobody dared touch anything. After supper, mother put the stuffed fat goose and the little pig into the heater's oven to roast slowly all night. Father set the dampers and wound the clock. Elmanzo and Royal hung clean socks on the back of a chair and El El Alice and Eliza Jane hung their stockings on the back of another chair. Then they all took candles and went to bed. It was still dark when Elmanzo woke up. He felt excited and then he remembered that this was Christmas morning. He jerked back the covers and jumped onto something alive and that squirmed. It was Royal. He had forgotten that Royal was there. He scrambled over him yelling, Christmas, Christmas, Merry Christmas. He pulled his trousers over his nightshirt. Royal jumped out of bed and lighted the candle. Elmanzo grabbed the candle and Royal shouted, Hi, hey, leave that be, where's my pants? But Elmanzo was already running downstairs. Alice and Eliza Jane were flying from their room, but Elmanzo beat them. He saw his stock, his sock hanging all lumpy. He set down the candle and grabbed his sock. The first thing he pulled out was a cap, a botan cap. The plaid cloth was machine woven, so was the lining. Even the sewing was machine sewing and the earmuffs were buttoned over the top. Elmanzo yelled. He had not even hoped for such a cap. 
He looked at it inside and out, and he felt the cloth and the sleek lining. He put the cap on his head. It was a little large because he was growing, so he could wear it a long time. Eliza, Jane, and Alice were digging into their stockings and squealing, and Royal had a silk muffler. Elmanzo thrust his hand into his sock again and pulled out a nickel's worth of whorehound candy. He bit off the end of one stick. The outside melted like maple sugar, but the inside was hard and could be sucked on for hours. Then he pulled out a new pair of mittens. Mother had knit the wrist and the back in a fancy stitch. He pulled out an orange, and he pulled out a little package of dried figs. And he thought that that was all. He thought no boy could ever have a better Christmas. But in the toe of the sock, there was still something more. It was small and thin and hard. Elmazo couldn't imagine what it was. He pulled it out, and it was a jackknife, or a pocket knife, we call them. It had four blades. Elmanzo yelled and yelled. He snapped all the blades open, sharp and shining, and he yelled, Alice, look, look, Royal, looky, looky, look at my jackknife. Look at my cap. Father's voice came out of the dark bedroom, and he said, look at the clock. They all looked at one another, and then Royal held up the candle, and they looked at the tall clock. Its hands pointed to half past three. Even Eliza Jane did not know what to do. They had waked up father and mother an hour and a half before it was time to get up. So they get up at five in the morning, but they woke him up at 3.30. What time is it? Father asked. Almanzo looked at Royal and Royal and Almanzo looked at Eliza Jane. Jane. Eliza Jane swallowed and opened her mouth, but Alice said, Merry Christmas, Father. Merry Christmas, Mother. It's, it's 30 minutes to four, Father. The clock said tick, tock, tick, tock, tick. Then Father chuckled. Royal opened the dampers of the heater, and Eliza Jane stirred the kitchen fire and put the kettle on. The house was warm and cozy when father and mother got up, and they had a whole hour to spare. There was time to enjoy the presents. Alice had a gold locket, and Eliza Jane had a pair of garnet earrings. Garnet is a red stone. Mother had knitted new lace collars and black lace mitts for them. Royal had a silk muffler and a fine leather wallet, but Almanzo thought he had the best presents of all. It was a wonderful Christmas. Then Mother began to hurry and to hurry everyone else. There were the chores to do, the milk to skim, the new milk to strain, put away, breakfast to eat, vegetables to peel. The whole house must be put in order and everybody dressed up before the company came. The sun rushed up in the sky, and Mother was everywhere talking all the time. Almanzo, wash your ears. Goodness, Mercy, don't stand around underfoot. Eliza Jane, remember, you're paring those potatoes, not slicing them. Don't leave so many eyes that we can see them jump out of the pot. Count the silver, Alice, and piece it out with the steel knives and forks. The best bleached tablecloths are on the bottom shelf. Mercy, look at us. Look at that clock. Sleigh bells came jingling up the road, and Mother slammed the oven door and ran to change her apron and pin on her brooch. Alice ran downstairs and Eliza Jane ran upstairs. Both of them told Almanzo to straighten his collar. Father was calling Mother to fold his cravat. I have no idea what that is. I'm guessing like a tie thing. Then Uncle Wesley's sleigh stopped with the last clash of bells. Almanzo ran out whooping and Father and Mother came behind him as calm as if they had never heard in their lives. Frank and Fred and Abner and Mary tumbled out of the sleigh, all bundled up. And before Aunt Lindy had handed Mother the baby, Uncle Andrew's sleigh was coming. The yard was full of boys and the house filled with hoop skirts. The uncles stamped snow off their boots and unwound their mufflers. Royal and Cousin James drove the sleighs into the buggy house and they unhitched the horses and put them in the stalls and rubbed down their snowy legs. Almanzo was wearing his boughten cap and he showed his cousins his jackknife. Frank's cap was old now. He had a jackknife, but it only had three blades. Then Almanzo showed his cousin Star and Bright and the little bobsled, and he let them scratch Lucy's fat white back with corn cobs. He said they could look at Starlight if they'd be quiet and not scare him. The beautiful colt twitched his tail and came daintily stepping toward them. Then he tossed his head and shied away from Frank's hand, thrust through the bars. You leave him be, Almanzo said. I bet you don't dare go in there and get on his back, said Frank. I dares, but I got better sense, Elmanzo told him. I know better than to spoil that fine colt. How'd it spoil him, Frank asked. Yeah, you're scared he'd be hurt. You're scared of that little bitty colt. I'm not scared, said Elmanzo, but father won't let me. 
I guess I'd do it if I'd want to if I was you. I guess your father wouldn't know, Frank said. Elmanzo didn't answer, and Frank got up on the bars of the stall. You get down off there, Elmanzo said, and he took hold of Frank's leg. Don't you dare scare that colt. I'll scare him if I want to, Frank said, kicking. Elmanzo hung on. Starlight was running around and around the stall, and Elmanzo wanted to yell for Royal, but he knew that would frighten Starlight even more. He set his teeth, and he gave a mighty tug, and Frank came tumbling down. All the horses jumped, and Starlight reared and smashed against his manger. I'll lick you for that, Frank said, scrambling up. You just try and lick me, said Almanzo. Royal came hurrying from the south barn. He took Almanzo and Frank by the shoulder, shoulder, shoulders, and he marched them outside. And Abner and John came silently after them, and Almanzo's knees felt well, wobbly. He was afraid Royal would tell father. Let me catch you boys fooling around those colts again. Royal said, and I'll tell father and Uncle Wesley, you'll get your hides thrashed off you. Royal took, shook Elmanzo so hard that he couldn't tell how hard Royal was shaking Frank. And then he knocked their heads together. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny. Elmanzo saw stars. Let that teach you to fight on Christmas Day for shame, Royal said. I only didn't want him to scare Starlight, Elmanzo said. Shut up, said Royal. Don't be a tattletale. Now you behave yourself so you'll wish you had. Go wash your hands. It's dinner time. And they all went into the kitchen and washed their hands. Mother and the aunts and the girl cousins were taking up the Christmas dinner. The dining table had been turned around and pulled out till it was almost as big and as long as the dining room. And every inch of it was loaded with good things to eat. Elmanzo bowed his head and shut his head tight, ice tight, while father said the blessing. It was a long blessing because this was Christmas Day. But at last, Elmanzo could open his eyes. He sat and silently looked at that table. He looked at the crisp, crackling little pig lying on the blue platter with an apple in its mouth. He looked at the fat roast goose, the drumstick sticking up in the edges of the dressing, curling out. The sound of father's knife sharpening on the whetstone made him even hungrier. He looked at the big bowl of cranberry jelly and the fluffy mountains of mashed potatoes with melting butter trickling down it. He looked at the heap of mashed turnips and the golden baked squashed and the pale fried parsnips. He swallowed hard and tried not to look anymore. He couldn't help seeing the fried apples and onions and the candied carrots. He couldn't help gazing at the triangles of pie waiting by his plate, the spicy pumpkin pie, the melting cream pie, the rich, dark mints oozing from between the mince's pie's flaky crusts. He squeezed his hands together between his knees. He had to sit silent and wait, but he felt aching and hollow inside. All the grown-ups at the head of the table must be served first. They were passing their plates and talking and heartlessly laughing. The tender pork fell away in slices under father's carving knife. The white breast of the goose went piece by piece from the bare breastbone. Spoons ate up the clear cranberry jelly and gouged deep into the mashed potatoes and ladled away the brown gravies. Elmanzo had to wait till the very last. He was the youngest of all, except Abner and the babies, and Abner was company. At last, Elmanzo's plate was filled. The first taste made a pleasant feeling inside him, and it grew and it grew while he ate and he ate and he ate. He ate till he could eat no more, and he felt very good inside. For a while, he slowly nibbled bits from his second piece of fruitcake. Then he put the fruity slice in his pocket, and he went out to play. Royal and James were choosing size to play snow fort. Royal chose Frank, and James chose Elmanzo. When everyone was chosen, they all went to work rolling snowballs through the deep drifts of the barn. They rolled till the balls were almost as tall as Elmanzo, and they rolled them into a wall. They packed snow between them and made a good fort. Then each side made its own little snowballs. They breathed on the snow and squeezed it solid. They made dozens of hard snowballs. And when they were ready for the fight, Royal threw a stick into the air and caught it when it came down. James took hold of the stick above Royal's hand, and then Royal took hold of it above James' hand, and all, so on to the end of the stick. James' hand was last, so James' side got the fort. How the snowballs flew! Almanzo ducked and dodged and yelled and threw snowballs as fast as he could till they were all gone. 
Royal came charging over the wall with the enemy after him, and Almanzo rose up and grabbed Frank. Headlong, they went deep into the deep snow. Outside the wall, they rolled over and over, hitting each other as hard as they could. Almanzo's face was covered with snow, and his mouth was full of it, but he hung on to Frank, and he kept hitting him. Frank got him down, but Almanzo squirmed out from under Frank's from under. Frank's head hit his nose and it began to bleed. Almanzo didn't care. He was on top of Frank, hitting him as hard as he could in the deep snow. He kept saying, holler enough, holler enough. Frank grunted and squirmed and he rolled half over and Almanzo got on top of him. He couldn't stay on top of Frank and hit him. So he bore down with all his weight and he pushed Frank's face deeper and deeper into the snow. And Frank gasped, enough. Almanzo got up on his knees and he saw mother in the doorway of the house. She called, boys, boys, stop playing. Now it's time to come in and get warm. They were warm. They were hot and panting. But mother and the aunts thought the cousins must get warm before they rode home in the cold. They all went tramping in covered with snow and mother held up her hands and exclaimed, mercy on us. The grown-ups were in the parlor, but the boys had to stay in the dining room so they wouldn't melt on the parlor carpet. They couldn't sit down because the chairs were covered with blankets and lap robes, warming by the heater. But they ate apples and drank cider standing around, and Almanzo and Al Abner went into the pantry and ate bits off the platters. Then uncles and aunts and girl cousins put on their wraps, and they brought their sleeping babies from the bedroom, rolled up in the shawls. The sleighs came jingling from the barn, and mother and father helped tuck in the blankets and the lap robes over the hoop skirts. Everybody called, goodbye, goodbye. The music of the sleigh bells came back for a little while, and then it was gone. Christmas was over. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Christmas time. What gifts does Elmanzo receive? What does he get? He got a boughten cap. He got a jackknife. Some whorehound candy, new mittens, and an orange. And a package of dry figs. Why are these gifts so, these are practical gifts, but why are they so special to him? They're special because he doesn't even expect to get any gifts. So anything he gets would be special. Why is anticipation sometimes wonderful and difficult at the same time? Anticipation is waiting eagerly for something to happen. How is that wonderful? Yes, it, it can be wonderful and exciting as you look forward to the things that can happen. But it also can be really hard to wait for something that you really, really want, and you want it right now. Name some of the foods that mother serves at Christmas dinner. Yep, roasted goose, roasted pig, dressing, cranberry jelly, potatoes, gravy, turnips, squash, Carrots, all kinds of things, parsnips and peas and pie. There's always pie, right? <laughs> Why does Amazo think that the adults are heartless? He does because they're laughing and he's so hungry, but he has to wait until all of their plates have been served till he can eat. So he thinks that they're heartless because they're talking and laughing and making him wait. The children are waiting and waiting and waiting for their food. Christmas traditions vary from family to family as well as from culture to culture. How is the Wilder's Christmas different from your own? Think about that. How is their Christmas different from your Christmas? Be thinking about that question. Okay. What does the threat of a switch have to do with Elmanzo's good behavior? Yes, exactly. Switches or a trip to the woodshed are the same thing as a spanking. And Almanzo does not want a spanking for Christmas. He would rather have gifts. Why did Almanzo quake when he heard Mother's comment that he might spill the stove blacking? Remember a few chapters back, he got mad at Eliza Jane for bossing him around and he threw the blacking brush at her and it hit the parlor wall? And it left a mark, but Eliza Jane fixed it for him. What, what happens on their Christmas morning? 
Yeah, the kids get up when Almanzo yells Merry Christmas because he woke up and they all run downstairs and they're making all kinds of noise as they empty their stockings and find all of their presents. They're really, really excited. And why does father tell them to look at the clock? Yeah, because it's only 3.30. It's too early. <laughs> what does Frank dare Almanzo to do? Yeah, he dares him to get on the back of the colt, Starlight's back. But Almanzo says no, because he knows better than that. And then Frank says, well, he's not afraid, and he does what he wants. And so he begins climbing on the stall, and he's scaring the little colt. So Almanzo pulls him down, and then they start to fight. Royal comes in, and he breaks up the fight. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and take our notes. Write your heading on your paper. That would be your name. The date for 21, 21, the lesson. And the lesson is chapter 25. I'm sorry, chapter 26. All righty. We just have a few vocabulary words, and then you are going to write a paragraph for me and turn it in. And I'm going to give you the topic sentence. A switch is our first one, switch. And that's spelled ch, three letter ch at the end, switch. A stick or a small branch, stick or small branch. Okay. Mm. Quake. Remember, Almanzo quaked when mother mentioned <clears throat> the, the stove blacking and the parlor. It means to shake violently. Ooh, ooh, he's really scared. Shook. Well, actually, I put quaked. So shook violently. Vi o lent li violently. And then finally, we have gouged. We're going to use ow, oh, ooh, uh, gouged. And that means there's, they use it when they're talking about the potatoes. The spoons gouge deep into the mashed potatoes. And that means roughly groove or to cut. Roughly groove or cut. Roughly grooved or cut. Okay, you are going to write, uh, these are the notes we have so far. That's the vocabulary. Now you're going to write a paragraph and you are going to turn it in. Let me find what it is we're writing it about. It's on the other page. Ah, we're going to compare the Wilder's Christmas traditions with our own. So you're going to have to think about some of the Wilder's traditions. You can use a graphic organizer. That's always a good way to gather your thoughts. Some of their traditions are the family comes over. They spend time with their extended family. They exchange gifts, but there's very few gifts, and they're always practical gifts. They travel in a sleigh, and they eat goose and pork. Those are some of the things that they do. And then they have a snowball fight outside, the boys outside, the girls inside. So that's some of the things that they're doing. And as far as what your family does, think about what your family does. Do you spend time with family? Maybe you do. Maybe it's just you, your family, you alone and your family. Do you exchange gifts? And if you do, are they practical gifts? Do you get a lot of gifts or do you just get a few practical gifts? Uh, you might travel by car or by airplane. You probably don't travel by sleigh, which is how they traveled. And we don't usually eat goose, but we might eat turkey and we might eat ham, but we wouldn't eat a whole pig. We wouldn't do a whole pig. So they're similar traditions, but they're not the same. Um, and some, And they check their stockings, which is also something we might do. All right. So let's go ahead and start our topic sentence. Um, 
Christmas at the Wilders differs from Christmas at my house. Let's use that as our topic sentence. Remember, it's a paragraph. Indent. And we're writing in cursive. I'm going to write in manuscript so you can read my topic sentence. Christmas at the Wilders is different than Christmas at my house. Okay, that is your topic sentence. Now you are going to tell me different ways. So you are going to compare and contrast. You're going to tell me ways that it is different, but there may be some ways that it is the same. For example, I might write, some of my sentences might be, um, the wilder spend time with family. Spend time with family. Now, remember, you are not copying my paragraph. You are writing your own paragraph. If you copy my paragraph, you won't get credit for it. Write your own. Copy my topic sentence. Come up with your ideas and rewrite and write them in your own words. The Wilders spend time with their families. Spend time, the Wilders spend time with their family. At my house, there's my introductory prepositional phrase. We also spend time with family. Okay, so now I have a simple sentence and I have a simple sentence with an introductory prepositional phrase. Okay. At my house, and yeah, I already used that sentence. I don't want to use another one like that. I need to come up with a different thing. We eat a large Christmas meal and the Wilders eat a large Christmas meal. Wilders eat a large Christmas meal. See how I am comparing and contrasting what they do with what I do? And now I would go on, and that is my compound sentence, by the way, because it's two independent clauses, and it's connected by a fanboy, um, a conjunction. So what I might continue on with, and I'm and I'm going to stop here, or our, our, our video is going to get very long. Um, I would then compare what they did for recreation, like the boys went outside and played and how that is different from what my family does at Christmas. And I would also compare the kinds of presents that we receive. The Wilders received only a few presents and they were very practical. Whereas at our house, we tend to receive um, more presents and they are practical and some are just for fun. I would I would use that kind of thing because we do give the grandchildren um, toys because they're kids. But we also give our children gifts that they ask for. So it may not be something that's not a practical gift. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm just telling you how you're going to compare and contrast. And then for your concluding sentence, so that needs to be a restatement of your topic sentence. So our topic sentence is Christmas at the Wilders is different than Christmas at my house. So my concluding sentence, I'm just going to put dot, 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 because I would write more in there. And then my concluding sentence would be something like, although there are many similarities, Christmas at my house is different than Almanzo's. Although... There are some similarities. Oh, 
Oh, look, there, we have a complex sentence. Christmas at my house. is different than Christmas at the Wilders. And I'm sorry, I'm writing on my bottom line here, which we normally wouldn't do, but I want to get it all on the same page so you can see the topic sentence and the concluding sentence together. Now remember, your sentences will be different than mine. Do not copy my paragraph. And yours is not going to have these three dots in here. I put those three dots in there because that was letting you know that you're going to have more in there. You're going to address the rest of the things. You're going to talk about the games that they played and, and um, et cetera. So anyway, there you go. That's what I got for you today. You guys have a great day. Tomorrow we have no chapter. Oh, we're writing an Earth Day paragraph. And um, so, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow because we're writing an Earth Day paragraph. And then Friday, we will have Chapter 27. You guys have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.